Are we good? Good morning, everybody. I am Cindy Novak. I'm the regional manager with the Blue Book Building and Construction Network. Many of you may not realize this, but the Blue Book has now been around for 108 years. We help connect the construction industry online, in print, and in person. We help connect pretty much everyone from the top of the construction pyramid all the way down to suppliers and wholesalers. Today, we are pleased to sponsor today's keynote presentation, Decisions, Decisions, Decisions. A lot of what happens in the construction process is decision making. Think about how many choices are made each day by your superintendents, project managers, and people in the office. Decision making is made up of two things, experience and data. The more you have of both, the better your decisions. It is my pleasure to introduce Bob Tinglestad, Construction Technology Principal with Plant Moran. Bob is one of Plant Moran's business technology leaders with an emphasis on technology optimization and analytics. His specialty is improving organization performance. Bob, over to you. Thank you, Cindy, and hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, so as Cindy mentioned, uh, I am part of our construction industry group here at, at Plant Moran. We serve over 650 construction clients and um, have over 350 professionals focused in, um, in construction. Uh, we are amongst the uh, employers with the highest number of certified um, construction industry financial professionals nationally. And uh, we have specialized expertise with um, developers, investors, brokers, property management companies, investment funds, general contractors, heavy highway contractors, home builders, uh, specialty trade contractors, et cetera. So thank you for joining. Uh, we're gonna go through a, a couple of learning objectives today. Um, first, we're gonna understand how business analytics can improve your organization's decision-making, um, lead to more data-driven decisions. And then also, you know, how can you create a plan to update your, your technology platform and, and structures to support that? So we'll start functionally with, uh, with data-driven decisions, and then we'll get into some of the technical details. So with that, let's start with some lessons from, from that we've learned from the pandemic. If there's one silver lining uh, of the pandemic, it may be that it launched us uh, forward both personally and professionally into the, the digital revolution. All of us have been enveloped in discussions and consistently presented with data, predictions, forecasts, and essentially analytics related to the pandemic. Because this is an experience shared by almost all of us, or probably all of us, regardless of your industry, position, previous involvement with analytics, it is a great shared experience with which to, to discuss how we can make data-driven decisions. So every day since March of last year, the COVID tracking project has been publishing data visualized in, in a business intelligence tool called Tableau. You may have heard of it. There are many other business intelligence tools on the market. Microsoft Power BI is one, but COVID tracking project has been using uh, Tableau. This data has been cited by the White House, CDC, numerous state governments, uh, and all across the, the media uh, platform. A global viral pandemic by nature creates the need for centralized, accurate, up-to-date data source to understand the virus and, and how it's spreading. At the level of economic fallout of the crisis, the severity and immediacy of impacts on supply chain, labor management, consumer demand have created an immediate focus on better data drive decision making. So now's the time to get invested in, in your construction company's data future. You probably have been involved in trying to understand, um, you know, COVID outbreaks within your own staff and, and how that affects uh, your projects. What tools and analytical skills uh, have you been uh, leveraging internally? Where is your ERP system and other transactional systems falling short of supporting your internal data driven decisions? How much time is going into manual movement, reconciliation and calculation of your job cost reporting today? 
Second lesson, uh, data enables better decision making. Data has informed policy decisions uh, around the release of economic aid, reopening of cities, improving public health capacity, and more. 100% of the time when we help uh, a client in the construction sector with analytics, um, we are either accelerating their ability to make data-driven decisions or we're creating new insights from their data that changes institutional or experiential biases. But we can all agree that even though we've started collecting a lot of data and there's a lot of data out there, um, it has not led to consistent results and, and rules and, and norms uh, across the country. Which leads me to number three, data governance is critical. Even though data on COVID-19 seems to be straightforward, it's a matter of just collecting cases, number of deaths, hospitalizations, it's much more complicated. Uh, the definition of a positive case can vary from one confirmed by a lab versus one that's probable based on symptoms. States have different rules regarding when to count a COVID death. Hospital systems all report their own data, influenced by varying regulatory, operational, and financial implications. In your business, do you have a consistent definition uh, in business rules for capturing and reporting on, say, job margin? Do you have a separation of, of change orders from original estimates in your WIP reporting? Value of information, and even more so user adoption, is highly dependent on consistency and quality of data. Lesson four, ensure privacy and security. The pandemic has increased efforts by governments to collect personal data. Since the pandemic uh, began, instances of data breaches, phishing scams, ransomware attacks, and frauds targeting government, healthcare, and citizens has also been increasing. Arising from your data governance policies should be frameworks to determine the purpose of all the data you're collecting, who manages it, and when or how it should be captured and stored to make uh, data usage more ethical and effective. For instance, a very simple example, be very careful as you collect your social security numbers of your employees and, and bank accounts for payroll. Make sure that data is not duplicated in, in development environments and other applications to reduce the chance of, of that data being breached. Number five, focus presentation of data on users and action. The value of data is determined not by the data itself, but by the message conveyed, uh, decisions made, and actions taken. For instance, within Plan Moran, we developed a, a dashboard so that we can see by state and county um, very quickly uh, the case counts, the trends, uh, as we determine if, if we're going to send staff to, to a client site or not. The visualizations allow users to tailor their search, to focus on regions, facilitating client and staff location specific decisions, and consideration of local policies at that time. Just one use case. Uh, number six, don't just be data historians. A, a lot of reporting that we see is, you know, is just reporting on what has happened in the past and it's not impacting decisions being made today. So in the case of, of the pandemic, how will the, the virus um, naturally decay on surfaces? How do age, other health complications, or nature of patient encounter, uh, encounters impact patient survival rate? What's the appropriate approach to vaccinations to maximize and expedite herd immunity? With any analytics program, we need to start with historical data descriptive and diagnostic and, uh, analytics. So for instance, what happened? Why did it happen? But the real transformational value of analytics is in being able to answer the questions, what is going to happen? What is going wrong that I can fix and impact now to improve my operational performance? Uh, how do we make those, those improvements happen? Lastly, have a plan, but be agile. Uh, while the pandemic has distanced us in many respects, we have all found incredible ways to utilize technology to remain connected. For instance, these virtual sessions. Uh, and by the way, thank you to Deb and the, and the 
substrong team for pulling this together. Um, many of our clients and communities are, are also building incredible processes and policies that allow them to both plan and continue progress while also remaining flexible and resilient as things change monthly, weekly, and sometimes daily and hourly. I know we're dealing now with, with our kids and, and school ourselves. So all are relying on data more than ever to inform these decisions and be agile. Analytics is a journey. It's not a destination. It's not a, it is a program that we encourage people to build the capabilities within their company um, to make data-driven decisions. It's not just oper uh, implementing one new operational system that is kind of a one-time effort. It requires agility, resiliency, perseverance, innovation, communication, and collaboration, uh, much like our path to prevailing over coronavirus. So this is not just about technology. <clears throat> we always advise our clients prior to investing in any business technology to start with questions uh, and not answers. Some questions, why? What is the business value of, of a technology project? And so what? What is the opportunity cost of not doing it? What are alternatives? What is the business risk of doing or not doing that project? What's the relative return on investment, both in dollars, time, and the distraction of change? This slide reflects common business questions that we hear from our engineering and construction clients that analytics can programmatically provide value-added answers to, and some have been updated to reflect pandemic-specific challenges. As you're reviewing them, some will likely bring a cringe with recognition and, and recall of the countless hours you are spending in Excel today trying to answer these questions over and over. Others may bring a smile and sense of pride because you're already down the path of uh, to automation and efficiency and have traded spreadsheet jockeying as we like to call it um, and uncomfortable meetings with management to explain data bus for proactive recommendations and self-service reporting for end users a couple more covid specific examples how will overall construction sector um, job loss impact our long-term labor force and growth projections how can we attract and retain skilled labor? Planners usually rely on yesterday's data, but need to anticipate future labor market changes, including COVID case counts. This risk must be understood and addressed to ensure successful project outcomes, as well as make decisions about current and future bidding. My favorite question on here, everywhere I look, people have different versions of the same data. Uh, if you don't trust the data or analytics and they're not applied consistently across your organization, then you don't have a data-driven culture and are likely missing optimization opportunities. So we're gonna talk through how do you create a data-driven culture in construction? It starts with identifying the activities that deliver the greatest financial impact across your company and increase collaboration and alignment. So we'll walk through some examples. First, working capital is crucial to every company. But as you all know, it's particularly important for construction companies. For years, there's been a continuing trend of networking capital decline across all E&C sectors, in part due to external factor pressure on owners resulting in either a reduction or extinction of advanced cash, increased exposure of contractors to uncollectible vari variations, um, claims and overruns. More work means increased cost of goods and services while margins are further squeezed. Working capital is an operational issue, but is often perceived to sit with the Office of Finance. Uh, the following, this get cash gap report shows uh, annual trends over the past five years. Shows AR days, inventory, net over under billings, AP days, and then 
calculates out the, the cost of, of that capital um, when it's out in the market. Sustainable improvements to working capital are complex and often require structural changes to interrelated processes. However, relatively simple reporting like, the, like this cash gap dashboard can be per, a perfect step to creating transparency and cross-functional accountability uh, and creating a cash culture within the organization. In this particular example, AR days consistently trend over 40 while we paid vendors on average in about a week. Some uh, AR opportunities might include billing timeliness and quality improvements, improved contract and milestone management, proactive and prioritized collection procedures, systems-based dispute resolution and root cause elimination. Some accounts payable opportunities, alternative payment methods and frequency management, including eradication of early payments, aligned and optimized payment terms. Moving on to inventory, improved coordination of production planning, uh, better alignment of materials forecasting with inventory quantity tracking and differentiated inventory levels. More detailed scorecards by role can cascade from this dashboard to further gamify, as we like to call it, the improvement of cash flow management across departments. Uh, it really is everybody's responsibility across the organization to manage cash. And it's just our job to help educate on how they can, how each person in their role can influence um, cash management. Um, in addition to cash gap, these may also include, um, you know, measures like current ratio, current assets, excluding inventory and more. Uh, some additional advice in today's environment, know where you stand financially, especially your balance sheet and be conservative. Establish more conservative financial benchmarks and goals to maintain during the crisis. Write off junk and don't lie to yourself. There's no fluff. Write off uncollectible receivables, claims, old retainages, reduce inventories for obsolete and unsellable materials, uh, accrue uh, future cash needs, increase reserves and, and accrued expenses for contingencies and, and uncertainties. And lastly, accrue costs for pandemic related uh, issues. Another example, how you can make data-driven decisions is your margin analysis or what is often called job whip. In our opinion, this is probably the most value-added application of, of analytics in construction. Uh, more, uh, much or all of the information exists in systems or modules within your systems, but the limitations of these transactional system reporting uh, requirements often don't allow users to really interact with this information in a dynamic value added way. For instance, can you produce a five year historical profit or gain a fake gain analysis sorted by type of work, division, customer, project manager, et cetera? And how does it compare to your company wide margin? Are you fully loading your job estimates and costs? to account for overhead? How much time does it take uh, your team to complete the company WIP process? Can you easily drill down to gain uh, visibility into the nature of profitability from job to job and give your project managers tools to predict future costs? Can you quickly see original contract amount, uh, contract amount revisions balance the bill, retainage, pending and approved change orders. Can you easily monitor, update, and forecast job to date costs, percent complete, and estimated costs, units, hours, et cetera, at completion for both original contract and change orders? Can this be aggregated to allow executives to analyze diversification of your current portfolio uh, project size, et cetera. And then we always encourage managing this, this gain fade or, or profit in, in a portfolio approach 
including you know retention of skilled labor which is such a, a, a key factor in construction example number three backlog and scheduling so depending on on the type of construction company you are there may be very different requirements um, this is an example at a high level from a heavy highway company uh, where they estimate and schedule based on a crew, which includes uh, skilled labor and also the, the fleet of equipment that's required for that job that day. So this shows them the crew days compared to scheduled availability An executive project manager, estimator, et cetera, can filter down to see their world or their area of responsibility. Uh, which keeps everybody on the same page and singing from the same song sheet as, as we like to call it. CRM and bidding and estimating data quality to show the, the backlog for the year. Subtracting out the crew days completed for those jobs from the project management system. Uh, also applied in, in here for, for this heavy highway um, example is the the asphalt material, uh, the tonnage of, of asphalt used uh, in the different mixes or, or recipes required. So there's labor backlog and, and material backlog required and uh, keeping those divisions and, and groups on this on the same page about what is coming up in the coming week and for the remainder of the paving season. Creating the backlog report and visibility um, and accountability can can encourage and force greater attention to and management of project scheduling data. It'll enable that your business development and sales teams to understand capacity to take on new work. Uh, backlog and labor management is one of the most critical functions uh, in the construction industry. Um, and it's typically managed by individual project managers in silos and in Excel. Maybe you have uh, moved past that in, in your organization, but we see that very consistently um, across construction clients. Bringing all this together across the organization can yield a number of um, great optimization opportunities. So should you have um, a fleet of, of equipment or, or vehicles, uh, are you performing a you know, if, if you own the, the, the vehicles or the fleet of equipment, are you performing a full life cycle of equipment costing um, to inform your internal costing and rental rates as you're bidding and estimating on, on your jobs? Do you have good data on your ownership and operating costs? Are you using realistic utilization numbers based on both prior years and current year project backlog. Can you, for instance, model the key drivers of ownership costs and, and operating costs? Can you can you predict, you know, when is the right time to to sell that piece of equipment and move into a new lease or or rental agreement? Can you iterate through those what if scenarios with utilization, maintenance intervals, shop costs? Should you do your own um, uh, work and maintenance on your fleet of equipment? Do you have shop budgets? On the usage side of equipment, do you have a, a sweet spot report that, that will help you uh, determine the um, your, your buy-sell agreements and, and when you might move into a lease? Can you see a, across project managers and your fleet um, managers utilization reports? Do you have bad actor reports where you can show the percent uh, predicted costs to compared to the fair market value of that piece of equipment. Can you report on lost revenue based on maybe who who is using that equipment? Um, most often when something goes wrong, is there some training that needs to happen with your staff? On the maintenance side, uh, can you report on the timeliness of completing various stages of service requests or work orders? Can you allow the requesters of, of the, the maintenance to see the status of their associated work orders. 
Do you have preventative maintenance forecasts and associated future mechanic uh, scheduling capabilities? And do you have mechanic productivity and, and scheduling optimizations? These are all areas where you can apply data to inform and improve your operations. Finance teams feel the pressure more than anyone to make the right decisions for the future of the business. An often overlooked component of analytics uh, is corporate performance management solutions. In our session tomorrow, we're actually going to be showing a performance management tool in action. So instead of just talking about some of these and showing some screenshots, we're gonna, we're gonna show you interactively um, how performance management tools can um, improve your, your efficiency in planning and what if scenario modeling and how it can make uh, an impact in, in your day-to-day decision-making. Performance management tools are essentially budgeting, forecasting, financial and operational modeling tools. And for years, uh, they were too expensive and complex for the, for the middle market, but increased competition among vendors and the increase of templates uh, and blueprints as, as we've developed uh, are accelerators. Um, we have industry use cases focused um, in making these technologies more accessible to the lower metal market. Your business critical financial reports, your PL, your balance sheet, cash flow, and WIP can be uh, fully automated in a multi dimensional environment with some data visualization capabilities and uh, increasing application of machine learning and statistical modeling to improve your ability to look into the future. So as Dwight Eisenhower said, <clears throat> in preparing for battle, I've always found the plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. It's great to have a plan and communicate that across your company, but as we talked about in, in the beginning, you need to be agile and be ready to adjust your plan based on current situation. Construction performance management, so just a, a high level visual of you know, some of the, the key systems that we often can tap into. You can develop your job whip and gain fade reporting. You can do planning in, in performance management tools and then business intelligence tools. You can do your reporting on gain fade, days of cash, margin fade, equipment utilization, et cetera. So with that, we'll move into how can you create a plan to update your business technology and data structures to support more effective decisions around bidding, cash management, labor, project management, et cetera. So some of the challenges that we see very consistently across construction clients is they have multiple data systems. Uh, Depending on the client, we see a range of anywhere from five operational systems to as, as high as 25. Um, there's often redundant manual and paper-based reporting. There's a, you know, based on those two bullets, there's a lack of a single source of the, of the truth as, as we call it. Um, you don't know, there's not one place to go to get an answer on say equipment utilization. There's unclear responsibilities um, for and ownership of data. Who owns the equipment master? Who, who owns the material master? Should you have that? Um, even your, your customer list, et cetera. And data and analytical skills um, and communication gaps. Uh, construction companies have been embracing technology over the years. Um, and are still often, most often, working through integration and, and data-driven decision-making. It's kind of the next phase as, as we see it. So when I say five to 25 applications, what am I talking about? These are the types of systems we see um, very consistently, an estimating and a bidding system, often a separate accounting system. Sometimes it's by the same, uh, manufactured by, or built by the same vendor. Um, and sometimes even in that case, they're still not that integrated. Uh, there's project management systems, project scheduling. The most common scheduling tool that we see is 
Microsoft Excel or some version of a, of a hosted Excel, fleet management software, and the list goes on and on. Some of these hopefully sound very familiar uh, to each of you. So when we talk about data analytics and some of the challenges, uh, let's just use the process of bidding uh, a job through, through job costing. So you might start with a, a market analysis on, on which jobs you, uh, sectors you wanna focus on and which jobs you might wanna bid on and do business development. Then you have a, a listing of your bidding opportunities. If you decide to bid, go through the process of estimating. If you win that work, bring that into your job costing system. Then you're managing change orders. Some people manage that in their estimating system. Some people manage it in job costing. If you have a project management system, you might manage it there. That process of making sure that your job cost phases, your, your pay items on, on the sales side all stay in sync, including change orders across your estimating, job costing, and project management modules or even separate systems, maybe even by different vendors. So to, you have a listing of your, your customers and owners in many of those systems. In the bottom left, you'll see you know, some of the, the data we need to master, the vendors that you're working with, the materials on the jobs, the job phases and pay items. It can be a lot of work to keep those systems uh, in sync and really enable people to you know, have a streamlined data entry process that's efficient while still informing all the different decisions that need to be made across your, your company. And oh, by the way, not only managing change orders uh, so that your percent cost complete, doesn't necessarily include that, which we consider a best practice. Uh, you also need to include changes to um, your internal, you know, you know self-perform work versus um, you know subcontract work. Let's show a real-world example of what we mean by mastering data. So, let's say this is our list from from our um, our CRM or our order management system where it shows our customer names, the number of orders that we have gotten from each customer and how much they've spent with us. Well, as we look at this short list, we can very quickly see that all the blue lines are really Bradley Wiggins. So if we cleanse that data, make it all one record, we see that Bradley Wiggins is actually our top customer, not Chris Froome, which it would show with that with poor data quality or, or master data management. So of course, when we're all uh, working with much larger customer lists and vendor lists and material uh, material lists, it can be much more uh, complicated to summarize and aggregate this information. But that's what we mean by um, data quality and master data management. And there's many dimensions to to data quality. Um, there's integrity of the data. Um, you know, the customer report on, on my report, is, uh, the customer record on my report is missing the address. So we have to fill in the data. We might not um, have the information flow into that system or report in time. It might not be fully complete. You might not have uh, decimal places correct. It might not be perfectly valid might have discrepancies between one module and, and another uh, within your ERP. Uh, and you might have people with different Excel versions of, of these reports and there's not consistency. So there's a lot to profile, monitor, and, and collaborate to, to truly have data-driven decision-making. So this is a very common, uh, this is a typical environment. You might have different systems, but uh, we see every operational system comes with a series of reports. And increasingly, uh, these operational systems and ERPs will uh, claim that they have a business analytics or, or um, business intelligence tool, and, and they, want it, they want it to solve the majority of your reporting needs. 
The problem is you typically have five to 25 different operational systems and that data is not going to end up in just one ERP and nor should it. There are best of best of breed applications out there, point systems, and we need to worry about operational um, application interfaces and enterprise reporting, uh, integrating project management systems, payroll, accounting, et cetera. So this is what we encourage, working through um, application interfaces and streamlining like between your project management and, and payroll, your, your time card interface and make sure that's automated and timely and not manual. But then also you need that data for, for reporting enterprise wide uh, so you can make data available to people when they need it, how they need it and where they need it. Technically some options so these are the operational systems that we talk about on the on the bottom left. Uh, business intelligence tools like Tableau and Power BI and many many others out on the on the market. We just often find that these are the applications people have heard about most frequently. Are the managed and ad hoc reporting uh, type tools. Managed being you go and run a report and you might pick a date range or a division and then look at the output of that report. Ad hoc would be more slicing and dicing. Maybe I want to drill up and down across my my divisions or or regions or customers, things like that. You can slice and dice data. All of that can be done directly against your operational system databases with more and more uh, SaaS offerings or cloud-based applications. That becomes challenging. You have to just run reports through that application. So. We can land and stage all that data in an enterprise reporting uh, data warehouse so that you can do reporting uh, across all those applications, both on-premise and in cloud, and really tie all that information together and master that data. Also, performance management tools in the upper right that can and it should be part of a advanced business analytics architecture. Um, and this central metadata layer is where you have your, your consistent business rules so you can apply that single version of the truth that we always talk about. So this is just a reference analytics architecture. Uh, analytics itself, there's cloud-based applications, there's on-prem applications. We can help through software selection and, and coaching on on any of that, but this is a typical analytics um, architecture that we'd at least encourage you to consider uh, every single component as a as a candidate in in your own analytics architecture. So that's the technical side of it. There's also the you know process and adoption and change management side of it. So analytics is a journey. It's a program it's not just a project it's not just build a dashboard and, and roll it out and and we're done uh, each organization may be depending on on the function may be in multiple uh, stages of, of their analytics maturity but stage one is basically an individual compiling data there's no consistency across from report to report and there's no governance um, but that's somebody trying to make data-driven decisions on their own, which is good and, and a, a positive move. The next level would be collaborating and, and compiling uh, reports at a department level. So at least within one department, everybody is looking at the same information and the data is shared and and um, and there's there's some collaboration and traction there. But maybe each department has its own interpretation of, of that data which would take us into level three, where data is combined across uh, departments. So human resources looking at the same information about labor and, and headcount planning as the project managers and, and the executives. Uh, data governance becomes important at, at that level uh, and insight can be gained across data domains. So that's all you know, describing what happened. Once you, ha once you get to that level, you can start predicting maybe what will happen and how can we make certain things happen. So that's the level four and, and level five. But building that, that data foundation and, and uh, 
and structure is important to get to eventually predictive and prescript prescriptive analytics. So data governance is a, it's a big jig, jigsaw puzzle where all the pieces around it are equally important, need to be in place to ensure your data is clean and ready for appropriate reporting. Some pieces that it includes, executive and stakeholder buy-in, is there data ownership um, organizationally, and, and are there data stewards in place? Do you have data management and security policies, as we talked earlier about um, data breaches and, and phishing scams and things like that? Regulatory compliance, um, GDPR, did, are, are, is your organization aware of what GDPR is and how it might affect um, your data retention records, um, P, pers PII uh, compliance, et cetera. Have you defined what metrics you, you want to look at um, across the organization to, to drive performance? And do you have, a, importantly, a communication plan? Uh, communication has always been important, and now data can just be a, a key um, a key component of, of that communication. Do you have role-based training and onboarding so that people can learn to improve the performance on, on their job by using the data analytics program? I'm just going to do a quick time check. Uh, a typical analytics program methodology, um, it needs to be with the pillars of data quality and, and data governance, which we've talked about and, and shared examples of, of what we mean by that. But we encourage you to iterate through business analytics. Don't boil the ocean or try to do it all at once. Define one key business, um, business need with a potentially clear um, decision-making path. Set those project goals and prioritize that, that business need and, and plan the phases of where do you need to source that data from, bring it together and, and cleanse it. Uh, architect the solution, build the, the data, uh, source the target mappings and, and transformations, and then build the, the BI uh, reports and, and visualizations. Once you have that data and, and the business rules pulled together, you can quickly iterate through uh, additional visualizations and and role-based reporting. Lastly, focus on end user adoption. Uh, it, you can build the best business analytics platform, and if it isn't adopted and used by everybody, it doesn't matter. It needs to solve a business need, and your analytics architecture needs to be built so that it has the ability to meet new business needs, unknown current needs. Um, so it needs to be maintainable and scalable. Um, the reports and the, and the platform needs to be understandable. It needs to be intuitive and obvious for each user type. You have to focus on good performance. <laughs> I like to say Google has set the uh, expectation of everybody to be able to search anything in the world and get my answer in, you know, sub-second response time. So your reports and, and dashboards can't run for, for a long time like some reports do. It needs to be accurate. It needs to be a single version of the truth and, and data governance. So if anybody is looking at a certain KPI across the organization, the same de definition applies. And there needs to be executive sponsorship. Um, there needs to be uh, team decisions driven through business analytics. It needs to be used in management meetings to inform and drive um, to drive decisions. So with that, um, we're happy to take questions uh, of anybody in the, in the audience. So I'll be monitoring the, the chat. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time today. I will say uh, we will be sending out, I think uh, Deb will be sending out the PDF of this PowerPoint at the end, but there are a number of articles that, that you could look at um, that will be shared in, in that PDF. These are a few that we have published.
Are you seeing any questions, Bob? Um, here, we just got one Great. From, from Nick. Thank you, Nick. What's the most effective way to ensure we are reacting in real time to job costing and P&L data that we analyze? So I would say make sure that, um, that everybody who, who you do want to have uh, you know, reacting to it is fully trained and, uh, and aware of where these reports are, how to access them, can they get that information uh, timely? And also a little bit of a center of excellence approach, maybe share stories of, hey, this is something that happened on, on my job. This is the data that I saw. This is the action that I took. And this is the result uh, that, that came from that. It allows people to know better and learn how to, how to make data-driven decisions. So. Uh, like, we, like I've been hopefully emphasizing throughout the presentation, this is not just technology, it's not just data for data sake, it's a communication tool and it's knowledge sharing. Um, Darlene asked, will the recording be available? Um, I believe Deb said yes, um, that a recording will be available. Um, I don't know if Deb's available to confirm, but I believe she said yes. And Nick, if if you have a follow-on question, if, if I didn't fully answer it, I'm I'm happy to answer a follow-up question or or chat offline. Nick just confirmed that uh, yes, a recording will be available and free to all attendees. Thank you, Nick. Great. Any other questions from the audience? You're on mute, Cindy. Um, all of the sessions to all of our attendees will be available. We'll make sure that um, you'll have instructions with how you'll have access to those. Great. It was a great presentation, Bob. Thank you very much, Cindy. Okay. I guess if there are no other questions right now, I'll kind of wrap us up, Bob. Um, we want to thank everyone for attending the opening keynote. Um, I'd like to throw out that the Blue Book will be hosting Friday's Lunch and Learn called Building Your Business Friday at 12 p.m. Mountain. So hopefully you'll be able to join me for a 30 minute session. Um, and learning about how you can help build your business with the Blue Book Network. And we look forward to seeing everyone at tomorrow's keynote presentation, budgeting, budgeting, budgeting at 10 a.m. Mountain. So we want to thank everybody. Bob, thank you for kicking us off. You did a fantastic job. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing everybody at 10 o'clock where, um, as Cindy just mentioned, tomorrow we will be... Um, walking through uh, budgeting use cases, how it can be uh, done in a performance management tool. And you'll actually see uh, uh, an example performance management tool um, in action. Fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. See you in the other sessions. Way to kick us off, Bob. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how we get out of this. <laughs> you did great. Oh, thank you. That was so informative. Good. I'm glad. Yeah, and so relevant. I thought you did a really nice job. Thanks. So do we know that 
we're off stage now? Yes, I, I, yeah, it says backstage. Oh, okay. I'm hoping. <laughs> 